Welcome back to the 234th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex. And today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including the REIT bubble or real estate investment trust bubble and how some of them are actually failing and asking for a government handout. How the world is viewing uh, America, as well as another one talking about the voter roll purge that is going on before 2024. And of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive, ready to take on the day. Now, there's enough rambling for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So when you heard about 2008, and this is for people that are a little bit older, but maybe for my generation, that learned about it after the fact, or lived through it, but didn't fully understand what was going on, did you have a skepticism towards real estate there for a little bit, or at least towards banks that were giving out loans for real estate? Because for a long time, the American ideal has been, hey, we're going to build up our wealth, we're going to settle down, we're going to get a house, and then from there we can prosper on into eternity. And when I first learned about the housing bubble, I was like, oh, wow, okay. So this is just like a, a market, just like anything else. It, it's not just something where you get your house, you pay for the whole thing. Oh, you know, young, naive conceptions of it when I was younger. And it made me question what was going on with housing and then going through COVID as well, looking at some of the prices now and uh, with interest rates up there as well. You're looking at the situation like, ooh, it's a little bit... A little bit rougher, and there's a little bit more skepticism within this generation, at least from who I'm talking with, that getting a house is going to be feasible, but also that it is actually a good investment with the volatility or with considering the volatility of the real estate market over the last few years. So maybe my generation's a bit jaded by 2008, and maybe they're going to be a little jaded by the COVID era, but... It's an interesting one nonetheless. But we're not going to be talking about you and me buying a house today. We're going to be talking about the uh, industry that has cropped up around it or the investment, how should I put it, the investment vehicle that has popped up around it known as a REIT. And as I mentioned before, it is a real estate investment trust. And basically what this trust does is it buys a a good portion of land, whether that be commercial, it can even be uh, domestic housing sometimes or rental apartments, and they buy up all these locations and they put themselves on the market, and then you and me as normal people can buy shares in that trust or shares. You can more accurately, more accurately, you can buy into the trust. But um, this article, it's coming from the Mises Institute, so you know they're going to have some pretty uh, vocal criticism of what's going on here in these different trusts, as well as how they're trying to lean on the government in order to get money. Uh, Quote, during the most recent commercial real estate bubble, two things happen in tandem. First, due to the Federal Reserve's zero interest rate policy, savers are unable to invest their cash at a decent rate of return. Second, prices of illiquid assets inflated in an extreme manner. A house is an illiquid asset because guess what? It's going to take you a while to turn it over. You're going to have to pay broker's fees, so on and so forth. Uh, quote, Riding on cheap debt and the rush of investors stretching for yield on their capital. Quote, such was the state of capital markets for several years as Obama, Trump, and Biden regimes, along with their counterparts at the Fed, pumped trillions of newly created dollars into the United States economy. Predictably, commercial real estate prices soared rising to a crescendo in late 2021 and early 2022, end quote. And, well, you see here that, one, that crescendo is at the tail end of COVID and when the Fed is starting to say, okay, hey, in order to actually deal with this extra money supply out there that people are willing, and I don't want to say willy-nilly spending, but they're spending because they have it in their pockets, they can get a little bit more, So therefore, there is more demand, and then companies realize either they have limited supply or they realize they can charge more for what they have a supply of. Uh, 
guess what? You're going to see inflation. So the Fed's saying, hey, we need to keep some of those dollars in people's pockets. We need to make sure that they're just not willy-nilly throwing it into the market. They're not just putting it in random investment tools. Um, we're going to raise the interest rates. And guess what happens when you... Oh, is it also why you saw a rise in housing prices? Because people said, okay, hey, we need a asset base, like they just talked about, that is a liquid. And also when you buy a house, you also are affected by the interest rate. So if it's low, then you're like, okay, hey, I can put this down at what, 2%, 3% interest rate, maybe even a 4% interest rate isn't that bad. And you can have a long-term investment that is something to store your extra cash in and you don't necessarily have to worry about inflation as long as the housing prices keep going up. But the reality is it doesn't always keep going up and it's kind of an upward spiral and then at some point it does stall a little bit. If interest rates are going up and that means the people who have the possibility of buying your house, not necessarily saying the people that just bought houses are trying to sell them immediately, but the market overall, if you just buy your house and then the house next to you is still for sale and then the market's starting to forestall a little bit and it stays at its top end and interest rates start to go up, then it's going to limit the amount of people that can actually buy that house because less of them are going to be able to get low interest rate loans, which means, guess what? That person next to you, they're going to have to lower their price a little bit to encourage people to come in with the higher interest rates or the ones that at least that they can get from the bank, and eventually that will actually bring down the value of your house. So you can see how this is very, the market can be very easily inflated, and the deflation can have an adverse effect on everybody within a specific market, but also in the housing market in general. Then again, it is also very different, and I'm not trying to say that overall the United States, hey, if you're looking at a house in these exact same circumstances but in a different location, like you have all the same amenities, it's the exact same size, you're on a hill, you have a good, nice pool in the backyard, whatever all the things are, but if that hill is overlooking, you know, Knoxville, Tennessee, versus overlooking uh, California, very, very different different costs involved there. So I'm not trying to say all things equal, uh, but you know, it's very hyper localized in some cases. And I, the best example I can think of is Kentucky versus Virginia. I mean, they're only two States away, but I look at the prices here in Kentucky and wow, I'll tell you now they are way better than anything I could pay for in Virginia. Now, let's be clear, you have less amenities, you have less proximity to certain things, but overall the houses are still pretty nice here, more or less, and you're paying, I don't want to say half, but maybe you're paying a quarter less for the same thing, if not more, depending on if you go really far, far north in Virginia, then yeah, you'll be paying at least double for the things here. Then again, it's a lot more jam-packed, uh, but hey, it, it's just an, an interesting thing when you start to notice the differentiation between these markets, and maybe that's because in here in Kentucky, there wasn't as much of a housing boom. So many people weren't moving in to Kentucky, so the demand is not as high, and that's a definitely part of it. But what the Mises Institute is trying to get at here is that the demand across all of the markets was artificial. And when that happens and you have an investment vehicle such as a REIT, a real estate investment trust, that is based off of these prices and the availability of credit to buy more when you're doing it at low interest rates, uh, it's going to create a pretty darn large bubble. Quote, throughout this time, the market for real estate investment trust companies that invest directly in commercial real estate prospered, at least superficially. However, in 2022, the Fed began raising interest rates we just talked about in response to high consumer price inflation. Commercial real estate values plunged. Publicly traded REITs or REITs, I'm just going to call them REITs from now on, which trade on the stock exchange and most widely disclose their financial performance, have seen share prices drop 25 to 30% from their peak price at the end of 2021. And 
And what's also happening here is there's not just the idea that, oh, okay, uh, interest rates are going down so people can't fund the purchasing of these things anymore, or there's other factors that go into that as well. But there's one really important one that we've covered here before, which is especially commercial real estate. Um, a lot of people are working from home. So if you do buy a giant office building, or even a small office building, and you're trying to lease it out to many different companies and things like that, or you build your own and you're trying to lease it out to companies. A lot of people don't need an office as much anymore. A lot of companies are downsizing their office to just be management who come in in person and the rest of the employees can stay out and they can do everything they need to on their laptop at home or they do a hybrid model where they don't need all the desks every day. Maybe if you have an alternating schedule, you can share a desk with a, a partner because at the end of the day, you're not going to be there all the time. So you don't really need your own desk. It's going to save the company money and space and so on and so forth. So that's another factor here. And we've seen a lot of companies and a lot of real estate companies start to default on some of these loans that they had taken out because they'd rather just take the the hit than keep paying these uh, exorbitant rates as they are nowadays. So what are the two specific examples that Mises Institute is pulling out here and talking about and using to talk about the government bailout side of this, which is something that would probably anger a lot of people. We know it angers Mises because, you know, hey, they're libertarians. They do not want to have money just willy-nilly. Oh, I've been using willy-nilly so much. I'm going to refrain from using that. They do not just want the government to hand out money to these companies because, in an ideal world, in a free market, if they don't survive, they don't survive. And the government interfering is only going to prop up bad actors going forward because obviously they're not doing something right. They didn't have insurances. They weren't backstopped. Their model just doesn't work unless circumstances are one particular way. So why would you want to allow them to keep prospering in the market by giving them government money? So the two examples are Breet and Shreet or Sheet. Uh, once again... If you're confused, it is literally REIT and it's REIT and REIT with a B in front of the first one and an R, uh, S in front of the second one. Quote, Breit and Shreet began operations around 2018, focusing on investments in trendy market segments and locations like apartments, industrial property in the South and Southwest. Both REITs were marketed as accessible and safe and secure investments, products that well healed but passive investors. So they were marketed for those people. Asset prices, prices tend to increase when the Fed prints trillions of dollars, and both REITs reported share price increases of roughly 50% from 2018 to early 2020. And they do have a graph here. And though they ended at the same point, they did take very different paths to get there, which I thought was very, very interesting. And if you want to see this graph yourself, you can check out the article and the link in the description below that like and subscribe button. Uh, but let's get back into the quote here. Quote, predictably, the commercial real estate market responded with a crash. And they're talking about when the interest rates are going up after 2022. Publicly traded REITs nosedives and cap rates, which measure the ratio of a property's income to its market value, increased by 46% from quarter one of 2022 to quarter three of 2023 in prime apartment markets, an era area heavily concentrated for Breit and Shreet. That increase in cap rates implies a reduction of 31.5% in asset values. So basically, they took on a lot of assets in this asset-rich market some old companies were, you know, trying to get these off their books because maybe they've seen some of these situations before. Maybe they're saying, hey, let's sell high because we're trying to get the most out of it. We bought it in the 80s and now we're trying to get it off our hands when it's a, worth a whole lot more. Maybe they don't see the conditions working out. Or maybe these trusts were just like, hey, no, okay, we're just going to offer you a lot of money because we see this market continuing, which would have been naive because a lot of that extra spending was based on the fact that we were going through an abnormal time and we had a little bit of an artificially slowed economy, so they were trying to juice it up a little bit. So the predictable thing is if we're going to try to juice it up a little bit, then we're probably going to have to intentionally slow it down as well because 
Guess what? When you juice up your dog, when you juice up a certain situation, it doesn't always nicely come back down under control. Sometimes you got to give it a, a few little um, melatonins or something like that to get it to calm down a little bit. Like when you give your kid a extra little cookie sh- that has a little bit too much sugar, you can't just say, okay, now now you go to bed. We're, like, hey, we juiced you for a little bit, and now you're going down. No, you actually have to expend some of that energy. And guess what expending the energy is in this case? Raising interest rates and trying to take a little bit of wind out of the sail of everybody spending so much money. And they're turning to the government for bailouts because they're saying, hey, we are a crucial market segment. We really, really need to make sure that uh, we stay in business. We don't want all of these assets to go to zero. We don't want all the people that invested in us to go to zero. Uh, there are some people who put in their retirement savings. And let's be clear, it's not as large as like the pension funds in 2008. But still, you can make that argument. Oh, well, a certain sector, you know, the real estate sector, they made a deal with us where they would put some of their assets in to uh, the retirement assets into our fund so that we could manage it and they could have a vested interest in the future of the real estate market, so on and so forth, blah, 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 blah. And they're going to mommy and daddy government saying, please, 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 can you, can you, can you help us out? And to return to the sugar cookie analysis, they've been on the sugar cookie this whole time. They are hyped up and now things are starting to crash and they're like, no, 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 I need, I need another sugar cookie. I need another sugar cookie. And the question is, is the government going to concede and give them that sugar cookie? Or is the government going to say, no, okay, you're tired, go to bed. I don't want to hear your whining anymore. Uh, I think we all know the answer to that one. I think we all know that the government are bad parents and they're just going to keep feeding the child sugar cookie as long as it asks nicely enough and uh, is able to persuade them. But maybe, maybe the government should consider uh, slapping its child across the back of the head and saying, no, go to sleep. And I do not... Uh, let's be clear. I am making a joke. Don't uh, slap your child across the back of the head. Uh, you are your own parent. It's your prerogative to parent how you would like. Uh, this is not parenting advice. I don't know if I actually need to make that disclaimer like you do with financial advice, but just don't do it. Don't At least if you do it, don't blame it on me. You're your own person. You made your own choices. I'm not responsible for what you do in your life. But that's enough on that one. We already talked about how the government is jumping into to REITs, and I feel like we spent a long time on that one. The reason I thought it was fascinating is because I was a business major. We learned about REITs, and I always thought it's an interesting investment tool, but it, it, I thought back in the day, I was like, but hey, it's very susceptible to bubble markets. And we were on the tail end of some of the COVID funding, so I didn't actually see this coming. I haven't had enough life experience to say, oh yes, this is definitely what's going to happen. But I'm definitely going to keep my eye out for things like this in the future. And maybe I'll put my money in REITs once things have calmed down. I'll put a little bit of money on the side. But as we start to go into an inflationary period, uh, once we start going up that curve, if it's 2 x in the course of a month and a half, I might get a little skeptical. I might be a little greedy and try to stay in, but I might get a little skeptical and pull out while the getting is still good. So let's jump to our second article that comes from Daily Costs. And the headline reads, The Great 2024 Voter Purge Has Begun. Can anything be done? Yeah, that's a nice little rhyme there. So what is the the great purge of the voting rolls? Um this is a very interesting article because the author just talks about a actual practice and then also tries to ascribe it to uh, political malice. And that is not to say that certain actors do not actually uh, do this in a unhonest way. That is not to say that actors don't actively do this in order to benefit their side. I'm not going to pretend like that is possible. But I do think that the author is a little overzealous. I think that they genuinely don't believe that any Republican or any Democrat could see a legitimate reason for actually going through the voter rolls and getting people off of them. And the reason I say this is not because they never even actually talk about the legitimate reason for removing people from voter rolls. There's a legitimate reason. People die. Not all the time when people die are they 
do that does their family properly inform the voter registration office. Sometimes people move and they don't actually inform the voter registration office that they have moved. There are multiple, multiple, multiple situations where the circumstances have changed. Some people, they register to vote when they're at college. And then, guess what? They don't leave, or sorry, they do leave. They leave college, but they don't tell the voter registration office that they are no longer in that county. They don't register in a different county. They go back to a different state, and there's not correspond. There's not a lot of interaction between state to state voter rolls. So, if you went to school in Ohio and you're from Indiana, uh, guess what? You go back to Indiana. You don't even think about Ohio while you were there at school registering to vote. You don't even think about the fact that you have that information there, and you didn't call them up and say, "Hey, just so you, go, you know, take me off the voter rolls." I, I, you know, I have moved. No. So those sort of situations are 100% legitimate. And there are reasons that we need to do these voter purges. Uh, I probably will get purged from the voter rolls in Virginia. I'm actually, because of this article, they provide the resources to actually check if you have been. I am going to go and do that literally after I'm done recording this podcast because I probably have been. Uh, it's not like I could actually vote in any of the primaries because I'm not registered one way or the other, so that one doesn't actually matter to me in Virginia. But the last election, I was unable to get back to Virginia to vote, and I didn't put in a absentee ballot. So I have not voted in an election in, whew, wow, it's, it's almost four years now. Now, some people say, hey, that's not enough justification. You know, that's not enough time to be like, okay, this person obviously doesn't live here or this person shouldn't be allowed to vote. We should at least remove them from the, the ballot or the voter rolls so that they have to re-register. And I would argue, uh, no, I, I think that this should be something that you have to re-register to vote every two years or so. You should have to re-register to vote Every single time that there is an election for Virginia, it's a little bit, and that's why I say two years for Virginia. It's a little tricky. Technically, it's like every four, and then every three, and then every two, and it, because there are Virginia is an off-year election uh, kind of deal. So when we do statewide elections, they're on an off-year. Governor elections are also on an off-year. Some of the smaller local stuff is uh, during the midterm. So it is a little bit split in Virginia. So I would say maybe every two years. But definitely every four years, I think you need to re-register to vote. And the reason I think this is important, one, because it's an opportunity to gain a little bit more accurate information. Maybe you've gone from uh, independent to Democrat to Republican throughout the course of those four years. So you should say, or at least if you're willing to, update that information to be more accurate. It can allow us to better understand the current demographics. And also, this is... I think there should be an automatic unenroll if you don't vote in a while. So then we don't have to do purges. We don't have to go through and say, okay, this person is no longer alive. Sorry to say that, you know, don't want to be mean to the family, but this person has passed away. So we need to take them off the rolls or especially in college towns, which is one of the main examples where the author's like, they're, they're going to college towns and they're purging people off the rolls. And my point still stands, which is yes, because a lot of people register to vote while they're in college. I have been at one of the, I have seen them. I have done one at the school I went to. And yes, they are very handy tools. But also, students don't necessarily think to say as they leave college, as they get that diploma, that they say, ah, yes, and thank you to all my classmates. Thank you to the voter registration office. And I will call you tomorrow to get me off your voter rolls. Now, they don't think about that. So it's a completely legitimate process to take and clear the voter rolls. So, and you may be saying, well, why does it matter? If these people are dead anyway, if they don't no longer live there, why does it matter? Because terrible, malicious actors could very well use that information to put in false ballots. Now, there are other accusations that the author makes in here. And the reason I'm not reading the entire thing is because it is so jam-packed with information. And it is, I would say it's north of 4,000 words? That's a guess, because they're also quoting from other articles and things like that. Um, but 
the the other main thing that they pointed out is that this is happening in areas that are uh, minority status, that they are underrepresented in the polls, they have been discriminated discriminated against previously, and they bring up certain cases that these groups have historically been discriminated against in a these different elections, whether it be in Florida in 2000, whether it be in other red or blue states or inner city areas throughout the course of the last 20, 30 years. Uh, they bring up a very specific one before the uh, 1992 election, I believe, the first Bush election, where uh, they were uh, standing out front of different polling stations and they were very heavily interrogating people who came in as to, okay, what is your place of residence? What, how long have you been there? Can you interpret this part of the Constitution, so on and so forth, making sure that these people were uh, either 100% U.S. citizens or that they were who they were claiming to be, and it can be overly harsh and vindictive, and these sort of tactics they like to point out historically and say, hey, the Republicans have been doing this for quite a long time. That is not unfair to say, and th this case actually did happen. The interesting one about the uh, voter voting machines in Florida and other county counties all across Florida that didn't necessarily have the resources to hurry people through to get new machines during the 2000 election. I thought that was really interesting because they say it as if, ah, uh, yes, Jeb Bush purposely sent out these terrible machines to the people, and they specifically sent them to these districts. First off, uh, and let's be clear, I read a, a book on it, so it doesn't mean that I know everything, but not just these counties that they're mentioning in cities and areas that would be majority black or Hispanic are the ones getting them. It's also in some rural counties, and it is also based on the amount of tax income, and sometimes these counties just keep their old machines. They just, they're just they still doing the old punch card ballots, Guess well in 2000. I guess that wasn't too crazy. Now it would appear crazy, but the amount of money that that county has actually determines the voting equipment they get. In most cases, it's not just oh, okay. Governor Jeb Bush says, hmm, you know, I really like Miami this year, and Orlando. Mm, no, I don't want you guys to vote. I, I want it to be harder for you. So we're going to give you antiquated technology. It's not malicious like that. It is it, Orlando has good equipment because they have lots of taxpayer dollars to pay for good equipment. Same with Miami, and even some places in Miami don't have the greatest machines either. So my point being. The author's making this seem as if it's purely malicious. They're just getting rid of all these voters just so that they can ensure that they are going to win. And maybe some state's attorney generals are, and maybe some people have malicious intent. I also think that, one, it's done in Democrat cities too, so hey, maybe you should talk about that. But I don't want to ascribe malice to everybody because there are legitimate reasons to actually go through the voter roll and get rid of old names that are no longer in the area. And yes, like I said earlier, if you haven't voted in quite some time and you haven't verified that information through the uh, voter registration air, uh, office in your local area, go do it. Go to vote.com and you can actually do a lot of it from there. Not all of it, but you can at least find a location where you can register. Just do it. It's your civic duty. And if you care enough, you'll do it because it's your civic duty. And if this article is going to light the fear of God underneath you, then good for the author because I think more people need to be aware of the situation that maybe they did get taken off the rolls because they haven't voted in a while. And we need more participation, not mandatory participation. We just need more participation because the best way to have the voice of everybody heard is to guess what? Have them go to the polls because Twitter, well, Twitter is great. You get your opinion out there. It's not quite the same as electoral politics, especially when that is the way that our government is set up. So I just talked to a whole bunch of platitudes. Yeah, take from it what you will. Let's jump to the last article that comes from the Bell Walk. And the headline reads, the world sees America falling apart. So for anyone that knows the Bell Walk, um, they are a center neocon neoliberal organization, old school conservatives who hate Trump. Um, 
that's probably the best way to put it. I, I don't, I don't know if that's unfair to them. I feel as though this article quite clearly highlights that they hate everything that happened on uh, J six, which is fair to understand. It, it's struck the fear of God into this author, into in particular. And also, what I think is really interesting is it scared a lot of his constituents who are in Afghanistan, where he was working at the time, or people that he's worked with in other countries. And considering he covers a lot of affairs outside the United States, when I was reading through this, it was very interesting to get the perspective of some other people. Uh, quote, I scanned through my Afghan phone and realized nearly all of my Afghan contacts, he's doing this on January 7th, by the way, had reached out. They were worried. I turned on the television watching horror with the dreadful scenes from the Capitol. So they're getting direct coverage in Afghanistan as well. And all the people continue to keep texting him. And eventually he texts back, yes, America is fine. I'm okay. We will talk later. And this is something that is very true. When they see, when any group that is an adversary or even friends, an ally, sees these different incidents happening across America, I'm always intrigued to see or hear about their perspective. And it's very true. A lot of states across the world, a lot of nations look at us. They look towards us. We're not saying that we're the hegemon anymore. Some are looking towards China as well. But We're definitely, if there's one country that you're going to want to hear about or you're going to care about outside of your own country, it's probably going to be the United States. Maybe that is American centric thinking, sure. But if America says, hey, we're no longer going to defend the, the trade lanes, that can have a major effect on your life. If Donald Trump gets in there and says, hey, we're going to stop backing NATO until everybody uh, pays their full commitments, that's going to affect a lot of different NATO countries. If you are Joe Biden getting in there and you are saying we're going to try to renegotiate the Iran deal, then people in the Middle East are going to care about that. Whether it's Trump or Biden, China is going to affect that. Chinese business people are definitely going to look at it and say, okay, hey, are we going to have higher tariffs or not? Uh, Then again, with Biden, they also have restricted access to technology for microchip production. So maybe if you look at both of those, you don't actually care as much. You're just like, okay, the U.S. is taking an anti-China stance. But there's definitely this idea that we, we can have a loud, very, very huge effect on the world with our microphone if we so choose. And some countries recognize that more than others. What I thought was interesting from the article here was how the author talks about our enemies using this to advantage, its advantage. Quote, America's enemies and advertise, uh, ad- adversaries immediately saw an opening and took full advantage. The Iranians, Chinese, Russians, and Pakistanis began telling our Afghan allies that American democracy was in peril. According to many of the Afghan contacts, they had the same talking points. American-style democracy will not bring stability but chaos. And my thing is, yeah, sure, I, and let's be clear, why would we want to give them a political opening like that if we knew beforehand? Yeah, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. I also think the author is kind of ignoring the fact that even if that didn't happen, they're still going to criticize our system. If that didn't happen, they could still call out all the oligarchs and Wall Street and the the legalized lobbying and control from outside parties. You could criticize us on so many things. They're going to spin a narrative no matter what. But this had a striking visual with it that did provide a more salient idea for our enemies and something that they could very easily used to their advantage. So I don't disagree with that one. It's an interesting read. I may not agree with the author on everything, but it's a very interesting read, and he has a very interesting perspective. And interesting is devoid uh, of any meaning. So let me rephrase that. It's a read that shows and tries to really bring to the front of the mind what America's position is and how other people view us within the world. And that is something that we seldom get to see here in the United States. And that's why I think it's interesting. So we put a little bit more meaning behind that word. But enough with me and my darn semantics. Let's jump into our daily delight. And this one comes from SWNS. The headline reads, Adorable Moment. Baby elephant struggles to follow its mom and trips over a... (laughs) 
tree in the woods. And it is, it is adorable. This guy looks so confused. He looks like me trying to run through the woods behind my house when I was younger and trying to get over a tree and be like, wait, but how do I, um, mm, I don't know. The hesitancy is just absolutely adorable. Uh, There's not really a quote to this one because it's mainly just a video. So if you want to check out this video or you want to read any of today's articles, like I mentioned earlier, there's a link in the description below that like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, as well as Podvine. And with all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.